talking to Vivian Dittmeier. She's a mother of two, an author, wisdom teacher, and founder of Be The Change Foundation. And we are going to talk about true prosperity, what that actually means. So uh, take it away, Vivian. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. I'm of course. Very to be of course. here. So let me talk a little bit about how I came to even write about the subject of true prosperity, because it's really closely linked to my own life story. Okay. I was born in Germany and um, was then really lucky to move with my parents to a small uh, tropical island, the island of Bali, by now very famous. Yeah. Uh, at the time, there was very few tourists living there uh, or anyone living there who, who wasn't from there. and. So that meant that at the age of four, I really got to dive into a completely different way of life. And I got to experience a type of prosperity that we in the West are sorely missing. And at the time I didn't really have words for it. My best friend was so poor, she had to work to make a living. So materially people were very poor okay. and this was tough. But whenever I would go back to Europe, which we would do quite frequently, I was really struck by what today I call an inner poverty. Okay. So there was such material wealth, everything was so perfect, so clean, so high tech, um, but there was such a coldness in it all and such, a, also on, in the faces of people, you could see that people were not happy. And this really, really confused me even when I was very small. And then I spent a couple of years in Germany living like the normal middle class life. And then when I was 13, I moved with my mother to the United States and yeah. ended up attending like a super prestigious elite college prep school with like the rich of the rich. <laughs> and to my great surprise, people were even more miserable than I had found them in Europe. Okay. And this really, really confused me. So it, it led me to some very deep questions. It also led me to leave uh, Western formal education. As soon as, as I graduated, I just turned my back and I went straight back to Asia, uh, following like a gut feeling that what I really wanted to learn wasn't to be learned in Western formal education. So I, I became a seeker, basically trying to figure out what, what is it that these people in this village had that we are lacking that makes them so much happier and more content uh, than, than anyone I've ever seen in the West. So this is kind of how I, I started to question our notion of prosperity and started to seek answers. And after like years of traveling and, and learning from many different cultures also, I returned to Europe because I wanted to contribute to like the cultural evolution. And then the whole sustainability debate really picked up speed and people started to talk about everything we need to let go of. Like we can't fly anymore. We can't drive cars anymore. We can't eat meat anymore. So it was all focusing on what we have to lose. Yeah. Right. And I felt like something is really off because <laughs> I had witnessed people who had a very small footprint and who were so much happier. Yeah. So that led me to set up the Be The Change Foundation in 2009 with the aim to introduce a new definition of prosperity into the sustainability debate. And now 2021, so 12 years later, I finally managed to put it all into words and to write a book about it Fantastic. and to present like a new definition of prosperity as something that we can realign ourselves with and actually realize that the great change that has to happen if we want to make it into a future that is viable, sustainable, beautiful, that great change doesn't mean life's going to get worse. It, it could mean that life will become much more fulfilling and beautiful for everyone. Yeah. That sounds lovely. Yeah, and I actually, I actually see people writing about this. This is what they want. They want to live in small houses in a small community and live off the land. Mm -hmm. 
be part of nature, re yeah. reconnect, get get like those closer family units, get yeah. a, a community going again, because like we don't have the connections anymore. Like we have exactly. things, but we don't have connections with each other. And that's exactly. one of the things we see happening a lot, especially right now. A lot of people are, are losing connections even more rapidly than they uh, have been previously. Yeah. So, so but, we need to reconnect. Yeah, and I see new solutions popping up really fast because now people can feel what they really want. Yes. So in Denmark, for instance, people are buying like small castles and making them into new communities. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, and then there's like, the, the, what direction do we take this in? Do we take it into these uh, high-tech cities where you live in a box? and you don't move around you're just there or do we take it out into the countryside and have these units like you i have never been to bali but i've been to many other mm -hmm. areas of the world yeah, where botswana. people botswana and we lived in china so like these closed mm -hmm. uh, like close communities and there's so much value and connection there this is actually also what, what I found in my reflection and research, because I also did a lot of research on this. I found that it's exactly what you said. It's about reconnecting. Mm -hmm. So we are lacking is connection. And it's not only connection with each other. That is one aspect. There's, a, there's been a tremendous loss of relationships, of relationships that really hold. Yes. So not Facebook for <laughs> friends or Instagram followers or any of that, but relationships where I really know I can rely on this person yes. and can be there for me in tough times emotionally, but also materially. Like mm -hmm. we've created these great systems that, you know, provide for us materially, but it's not enough. It's not the same thing like having a family or friends or community who are going to be there for us in tough times. But that's just one aspect. I mean, the other the other connections that we've lost are connections to our creativity. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people have lost uh, this connection to their innate sense of flow and and like unfolding their talents. And the the other connection that we really lost is to time. <laughs> so what I mean by that is. I call it prosperity of time. So there's prosperity of relationships, prosperity of creativity, and prosperity of time. And prosperity of time means that we are at peace with the phenomenon of time. We're not fighting it by like trying to save it mm. or fighting it by trying to pass it with pastimes, you know, just watching Netflix or doing things just to make the day pass because we don't really know what to do with it and we're not really comfortable being in the moment and experiencing the cycles of nature our own cycles the passing of time and that's something that traditional cultures had and that's why they lived in the sense of timelessness and spaciousness also that yeah. we in the modern world are sorely missing and it's making us really sick yeah. so these are like three connections that we've lost and then of of course, there is the connection inside, the connection to like the mystery of life, the, the pulse of life, the connection also to our inner guidance. And I call that spiritual prosperity, which is something that I've also witnessed in so many cultures that I've lived in and learned from, that it's just normal. It's a normal part of every traditional culture to have some kind of uh, connection, some way of cultivating uh, this connection to the sacredness of life, essentially. But that's again, as a question of connection, also like when you talk about time, we have this commodification of time as well, where we sell our life in these units, whether it's going to a school or it's going to a job, we sell our time to someone else and we're disconnected from it. It becomes these square blocks that we can move around yeah. instead of having this flow. And you have now we we're sitting here it's, it's really convenient having these computers and everything and all this electricity but when we've had power outages up here in the mountains like suddenly it gets dark really early and you can't do anything so you go to bed because it's winter now and then when it's summer you have longer days where you can be outside and work but if you're in this factory setting where it's 
the same all year round. You don't exactly. notice all the changes. Yes. And this is actually one thing that I encourage people to do in my book. I encourage them to explore whether letting go of certain comforts can actually increase their quality of life. And one of the experiments that I've done with my family is we lived without electric light for a full year by choice. What? Yeah. So we had electricity. We have like a perfectly modern house, fully equipped, but we chose not to use it. Okay. because and it all started because my son was curious and he's like mom I wonder what life was like before people had electric light I wonder how they slept I wonder how they woke and I was like well why don't we try it mm. and we ended up keeping it for a full year and it was so beautiful it was really really magical and what happened was that we ended up spending a lot more time just hanging out together doing nothing just sitting on the sofa maybe with a candle or not even with a candle mm -hmm. cuddling talking, being silent. That's what we ended up doing a lot more. And it really increased our quality of life. Sounds then, yeah, like after a year, we let it go. And still, I've now I use electric light much more consciously. It's really changed my relationship to it. What made you go back? Um, it came to a point where I noticed sometimes I really like having light. And I like putting like a light and reading and having it really as something that I enjoy. And then suddenly it became something where I wasn't allowed to have light. Like it became something. <laughs> like light. And then my rebels are like, wait a minute. No, I want to be allowed to use light. And that's when we went back to using light. And, and still, I'm very grateful. Like we did different experiments in this direction. Like, yeah, like, for example, we grow all our own vegetables. And this is something that most people say, oh, it's so much work but it's actually greatly increased our quality of life or buying regional food greatly increased our quality of life. Like we walk to the place where they grind our flour and we buy the flour and we buy the bread and it's, it's more, it's less convenient and comfortable, but it's greatly increased my quality of life because it's reconnected me to the food I eat. So now when I, when I eat, I'm like, wow, what a miracle, this carrot, like I've seen it as a seed and now I get to eat it. And I'm like in full awe of this whole miracle, which I never was when I would just pick it up, even at the organic store, it's just not the same. Like it becomes a commodity, just like time, like you said. Magic. I just want to ask her some really curious, what did you do with your laundry? Did you wash it by hand? No, so the laundry is an interesting story. I lived in India for several years and my uh, oldest son was born there. And at the time there was no throwaway diapers in India and there was no washing machines. So we did everything by hand, like everyone did. And that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, but now, no, like I said, we had electricity and we used it for cooking, for laundry, for computers. Like we used electricity, but we just chose not to use light. Okay. Okay. So it's quite simple. You just don't switch on the light. <laughs> like it's not a big thing. And it was just about, it was, it was an experiment just in exploring that one thing. Okay. Um, but you can do it with a lot of things. Like we've also explored it. Uh, like we were vegan for five years and it all started with an experiment of like, I wonder what it's like to be vegan. <laughs> and we did it for two weeks and then it was so good. We did it for five years and then we went back. We, we switched to being more regional. So I think it's a lot about experimenting yeah. and questioning the notion of more is better because we already have way too much. And for most of us, I think our quality of life is going to get better if we dare to let go of things. And I know for a lot of people, when they make the step, for example, of cycling more, that's a similar experience that of course, it's much less convenient, uh, but if you actually do it, it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. Like it's so beautiful. Or I recently walked home from the train station. It took me three hours. It was magical. <laughs> if I'd taken the bus, I wouldn't remember it. But now this, I remember this for years. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, so actually the last, the last uh, dimension of prosperity, because I've mentioned like prosperity of time, relationships, creativity, um, spirituality. The last dimension I just want to add um, that I want to suggest, and this is really a suggestion, is 
uh, ecological prosperity. So where we reconnect and we learn to fulfill all our needs through healthy relationships with the ecosystems in which we are embedded. And this is something we can't do individually. We have to do this collectively. We have to do this together to transition back into reconnecting because we live in this illusion that we're only dependent on the economic system and we're only dependent on the industrial system because that's our experience. But we know that the industrial system and the economic system are actually embedded in the ecosystem. And the, this bubble of illusion that as long as the economy is healthy and the industrial system is healthy, we're all gonna be happy and taken care of, this bubble is bursting. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to reconnect to the larger reality of the ecosystems that we're embedded in. Yet I can take individual steps, you know, I can cycle more and I can grow my own food and I can spend more time in nature and I can do all that. And that's going to increase my quality of life because it's going to reconnect me. I can reconnect to the cycles, like you said, mm -hmm. I can do all that. And yet we, we all know it's not enough because it's something we need to do together. And I yeah. feel it's very important to, to be yeah. really aware also of the limitations of individual lifestyle changes in that regard. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm thinking smaller farms is really important because yeah. we have these huge farms and there's, it's, yeah, it's just horrible when you, when you visit them and see what's going on. And uh, in one of my educations, I went to a farm where they, they had cows, I think, and it was so much water they spent mm -hmm. every day. And I was just, in, I was in shock. And in Denmark, when, when they talk about their livestock, it's like production, not a, <clears throat> like a cow or pig, it's a production unit. Yeah. And I know that a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, large parts of Germany is actually slowly turning into desert because the, the soil is not sustainable anymore. So when we do this monoculture thing and we think we can treat it the same way we do with light and everything else, like it's something that can just be used. Mm -hmm. it, it also needs, like we need to have a cyclical relationship with it. It needs to be given something back. The soil needs to lie fallow. It needs not just fertilizer, it needs love. And you can't do that in those monocultural ways. So yeah, and what we there. what we forget is that we are missing the contact with the land. And this became so clear for me once we started growing our own food. Mm. I noticed that this was important for me. Before I thought, like, you know, it's something we need to do for the soil, it's something we need to do for the cow, we need to do for whatever. Mm. And now I understood it's equally important for me. Yes. Because it heals me, it reconnects me. And also, it, and it has a lot of different dimensions. It's something we do, we do together with other people. So it has like a community and relationship dimension. It also has a time dimension because it really slows you down. Like you just see, you, you can't speed it up. Like you put the seed no. and you take care of it. <laughs> and then it just takes time. Yeah. And, and so there's so many aspects of that that are really, really good for us and really healing and bringing us into, into sanity, kind of. So yeah. there's, there's so many arguments for, uh, like you say, scaling down, uh, going back to smaller units. And uh, like it, it also increases like the biodiversity and uh, it, it traps a lot of carbon in the soil. Like it's from so many directions. But the one aspect that we often forget about is how important it is for us, yeah. this, this reconnecting and how it actually improves our quality of life. And not like we're often told like, oh, you're so poor, you have to work the land. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you just saw, head on over to whoselifeisitsummit.com forward slash podcast, where you can find full length episodes as well as in audio format. And we do a lot of other cool stuff. You can hang out with us and other like-minded individuals who want to create a world that works for everyone. And we do that on our platform where we can chat and we have Q and A's and exclusive interviews as well. So there's so much to get over there. So come on over and play with us.